Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on lessons, themes from the Gospel of John. And this is lesson number six in that series entitled, More Testimonies About Jesus. We've had several lessons on testimonies about Jesus, but now there are more testimonies about Jesus. What do you think they'll say this time? This is the lesson for November 9 of 2024. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we review the times when you were here on this earth and you mingled with us as human beings, teaching and giving examples, performing miracles, doing raising people from the dead, all those kinds of things. Help us to understand the implications of what you did and what that might mean for us in our day is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. In our last few lessons, we have reviewed evidence about the Messiahship and the divinity of Jesus Christ. As we will see in this lesson, Jesus not only stated clearly that he was divine and what he was sent to do, but also he demonstrated his divinity by giving, its mirac giving us mirac miracles and signs. Does that it, demonstrate divinity? Miracle well, I will science. tell you that I just listened to this week as I was running, because I listen to lectures as I, or sermons and so forth when I'm running on my MP3 player, something that I really had struck me, it rang a bell with me. This person said, Jesus finally said, okay, I will give you this. We know this, the Bible says, I will give you the sign. The sign I will give you is the sign of, of Jonah three days and then three nights kind of thing. And what he was really saying was this. He says, if you want me to prove that I'm divine, kill me. And then I will raise myself from the dead. There's no way anybody who was not divine could do that. Yeah. So kill me and then I'll prove it to you. So is that, how's that for a start? Is that, is that somebody's is that a biblical quote, or is that yeah, no. some guy's interpretation? Jesus didn't invite him to kill himself, did he? Well, no, he, he knew what was going to happen. But he said, if, he, he said to them, I will give you the sign of Jonah. Yeah, I, I, I have no problem with that. I mean, I'm in harmony with that, but, but Jesus didn't say, well, go ahead and kill me and see what happens. It's the modern translation. Come on. Well, no, it's, well that's, yeah. that's one of the problems with perversion of, of, of languages and then try to uh, translate uh, from one to another is, is but even the point is, the problem. The point is Jesus knew what they, were gonna, what they were going to do. So that's why he said that. My, my thoughts on this one, a little different thing, is that, that uh, is, the, is the humanity of Christ that died in the cross, yeah. not the divinity. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we're talking about that here. divinity cannot die. Yeah. Well, when Christ comes, will he do more signs than, than these that which this man has done, was one of their questions. We will discuss the testimony of John the Baptist, God the Father, Jesus himself, Nicodemus, and the crowd. Okay, so what do we learn from these sources? God sent John the Baptist to prepare the nation and this earth for Jesus. Jim? John 1, verses 6 to 8. God sent his messenger, a man named John, who came to tell the people about the light, so that all should hear the message and believe. He himself was not the light. He came to tell about the light. American Bible Society, Good News. Okay. Society. So John is going to give his testimony. Myra? From the Bible Study Guide, it says, In this lesson, we will further explore the testimony of John the Baptist. John was not confused or doubtful as to the identity of Christ. At every turn, John pointed to Jesus as the Son of God and as the embodiment of, the, of fulfilled prophecy. John was by no means a time-saving politician. Time-serving. Her serving politician. <laughs> no time-saving with politicians, um, <laughs> who pandered to the crowd. Rather, he was committed to the revealed truth of God's kingdom. Regardless of whether 
it was accepted by the majority of the people or not. John was even willing to stand alone and unwavering for the truth that he was sure was sent from God. This week we will also learn that the truth brings about division and determines who will receive it with open minds and humble hearts. Okay, we will also review the witness that God the Father gave concerning Jesus to John. In John 1, 31, we see clearly that God revealed to John that Jesus was the Messiah. And I'm not sure that this is compelling evidence. We're going to see a lot more compelling evidence in a little bit. But John 1, 31 from Good News Bible. I did not know who he would be, but I came baptizing with water in order to make him known to the people of Israel. This is John speaking. What do you think we should learn from the humble position that John took toward Jesus? Notice these words which God gave to John the Baptist. Now we're going to get into it. It's enough to... So this is just continuing on with John yeah. 1, verses 32 through 36. John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and stay on him. I still did not know that he was the one, but God who sent me to baptize with water had said to me, you will see the Spirit come down and stay on a man. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt, for, interrupt sure. for a second. What do you think John the Baptist saw? The Holy Spirit in what he could best describe as a dove. Okay, we've heard in the Bible, we, we've had the Holy Spirit described as a dove and as a flame. Flame. Those are the two descriptions we have. Okay, go ahead. You will see the Spirit come down and stay on a man. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen it, John said, and I tell you that he is the Son of God. He is divine. Did anyone besides John see this manifestation of the Father and the Holy Spirit at the baptism of Jesus? We don't have any evidence that other people saw it, do we? No. It doesn't say. He told people every, about it. it doesn't say, and everyone else saw the dove. No. no. The next day, John was standing there again with his two disciples. When he saw Jesus walking by, there is the Lamb of God, he said, from the Good News Bible. Okay, so what did John actually see when the Spirit came down? We've already discussed that a little bit. Did the Spirit come down on more than one occasion? Or only at the actual baptism? So in other words, my question is, did the Spirit come down on Jesus earlier so that Jesus, so that John the Baptist, oh, he's the one, and then he baptized him, or did he, he not know who Jesus was until he actually baptized him? What do you think? So you're talking about the timing of... Yeah, the, so here's this big crowd, and people are coming down, and they're listening to John, and they're asking to be baptized. And what we have here is John saying, here's a lamb of, you know, these were first cousins, you know. Yeah, we're going to read about that in a moment. But they didn't know each other. Yeah. Yeah. So was John baptizing them into the Seventh-day Adventist Church? <laughs> no. What was his baptism for? The church. Forgiveness. <laughs> Forgiveness of sins. Is that what we baptize for? Hopefully. <laughs> Why did John choose to call Jesus the Lamb of God? What did that mean to the people who first heard those words? From the writings of Ellen White. When at the baptism of Jesus, John pointed to him as the Lamb of God, a new light was shed upon the Messiah's work. The prophet's mind was directed to the words of Isaiah. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, Isaiah 53, 7. During the weeks that followed, John, with new interest, studied the prophecies and the teaching of the sacrificial service. Now, I'm going to interrupt for a second again. John out there in the wilderness, he just rushed down to the public library and checked out the gospel. Now, one of the possibilities here, you, well, I think all have heard about the Essenes. Yeah. There are many people who believe that John was trained by them, and they obviously would have had Gospel, they would have had scrolls. 
they had lots of scrolls. Obviously, they, they, they hid some of them in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's where they came from. So it's possible that Jesus, I'm not Jesus, I'm sorry, John, because that wasn't very far from where he was preaching. He went over there to do some study. Would John have been allowed to go into a temple and look at what scrolls the temple had? Well, his father was a priest. Or did John go and ask some people who had memorized the scripture and ask him questions, ask, ask them questions that might have provoked bringing things together in their mind? Or and they conveyed it to him, yeah. John. Or as a <coughs> potential future priest, was he, how much of the Old Testament did he memorize? Is he doing a Paul and doing a fruit basket upset for, Paul took several years to do it. Yeah. Saul, Saul Paul yeah. and uh, John anyway. the Baptist apparently didn't he, take very long. He also knew what happened to Simeon. And yeah. so this was coming together, I believe. Okay, Lauren, I'm sorry for the interruption. He did not distinguish clearly the two phases of Christ's work as a suffering sacrifice and a conquering king, but he saw that his coming had a deeper significance than priests or people had discerned. When he beheld Jesus among the throng on his return from the desert, he confidently looked for him to give the people some sign of his true character. Almost impatiently, he waited to hear the Savior declare his mission, but no word was spoken, no sign given. Jesus did not respond to the Baptist's announcement of him, but mingled with the disciples of John, giving no outward evidence of his special work and taking no measures to bring himself to notice. Okay, why do you think Jesus mingled with disciples of John? They were all of one accord. I mean, first of all, there was disciples of, Je disciples of Jesus and there was disciples of John, and there was a little bit at odds together. And so I think he was trying to bring those two groups There's a to good, unify these two groups. There's very good hints. Now, you can't just say so many words. Very good hints that Jesus' two cousins, James and John, were former disciples of John the Baptist. Very likely. Okay, how did John come to understand so clearly what his mission was? He said, God showed me, God told me I'm gonna do this. Did he have regular conversations with God of some kind? What does his testimony tell us about Jesus? Was this testimony just for the benefit of John and his disciples or were there other people involved? Lots of questions. The Jews were looking for someone to deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. Yes. Yes. The Jews looked for a Messiah to come who would deliver them from the rule of Romans. Long under oppression, the Jews believed that the Messiah would not only overthrow Rome, but would establish them as a great and powerful nation. John's words, however, calling Jesus the Lamb of God, although directly pointing to his anointing sacrifice. Atoning. Atoning sacrifice, probably misunderstood by the majority of people. They might have not known what he was talking about at all. I'm not sure I understand what an atoning sacrifice yeah. is. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Our Bible, yeah. Our Bible study guide calls Jesus' life an atoning sacrifice. What is an atoning sacrifice? Is that Whatever what? Whatever it is, they probably have the wrong answer. Is that what Jesus was? Was that his mission? Now, let's just be clear. To many Christians, many of our Christian friends, Jesus came for one purpose, and that was to die to pay the price for our sins. Which so, is a lie. Well, but because, that's what. Because God demanded it. Yeah. Me, I, I mean, I'm not, that's their message, and that's what yeah. they think is the message, but that is not true. Yeah, well, I'm not arguing with that. <laughs> to, to me, I think uh, Graham Maxwell really hits it hard in, mm. and right. He came to vindicate the character of God. Right. I, had, I was at the doctor's office two days ago, and uh, she, uh, uh, she interviewed me for having my cataracts. 
taken care of. Anyway, some, she said, well, that's from the Bible. And then she, I says, uh, um, did uh, anybody, uh, your church, or like she goes to the Baptist church. Oh, okay. And then a little later I says, uh, do they teach that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins and that the law was tailed to the cross? Yes. Mm -hmm. I says, those are both lies. There's no scriptural support for what, <laughs> what you just <laughs> told me. <laughs> yeah, that was probably a little blunt, but <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's uh, true. I'm not... A lot of time. Yeah. Well, what would we spend uh, uh, yeah. dancing around the, on the point yeah. issue? Jesus also clearly understood the purpose for which he had come to this earth. God did not plan for him to become a political or military leader. That thing we know for sure. So but, talking about dancing around, we, in our last lesson we talked about Jesus knew exactly what to hit with Nicodemus and exactly what to hit with the yeah. Samaritan, uh, Samaritan woman. woman. The question is, do we know exactly what to They're hit? They're not going to hurt it at any younger age. Yeah. What right? do you think John's parents told him about what led up to his birth? Did he hear the full story maybe many times? I bet he did. He did. Okay. Jesus, from Ellen White, Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins and closely related by the circumstances of their birth. They both had pro prophetic announcements about the birth, yet they had no direct acquaintance with each other. The life of Jesus had been spent at Nazareth and Galilee, that of John in the wilderness of Judea. Amid widely different surroundings, they had lived in seclusion and had had no communication with each other. Pro Providence had or ordered this. No occasion was to be given for the charge that they had conspired together to support each other's claims. This is our pages 109. While the interaction between Jesus and John the Baptist was primarily at the time of the baptism of Jesus and after his period of temptation in the wilderness, that was not the end of their interaction. John continued to preach. John's disciples became jealous of Jesus and of Jesus' success. Jim? John 3, verses 25 and 30, 230. Some of John's disciples began arguing with the Jews about the matter of ritual washing. So they went to John and said, Teacher, you remember the man who was with you on the east side of the Jordan, the one who spoke about, you spoke about? Well, he is baptizing now and everyone is going to, to him. John answered, No one can have anything unless God gives it to him. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. The bridegroom is the one who, to, whom you, to whom the bride belongs, but the bridegroom's friend who stands by and listens is glad when he hears the bridegroom's voice. This is how my own happiness is made complete. He must become more important while I become less important. Good news, Bible. The devil obviously did everything he could to try to disrupt, disrupt the work of Jesus. Satan managed to cause a dispute between the disciples of John the Baptist and those of Jesus. Fortunately, John was above this kind of nonsense. He knew exactly what his role was supposed to be and he intended fo to fulfill it. And of course, we know that a number of the disciples of John migrated to become either close followers, or even disciples of Jesus. <clears throat> There are some very important, power, some very powerful words describing the relationship between John, between John and Jesus, words spoken by John himself. From John 3, 31 to 36. He who comes from above is greater than all. He who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly matters. But he who comes from heaven is above all. He tells what he has seen and heard, yet no one accepts his message. But whoever accepts his message confirms this by this that God is truthful. The one who God has sent speaks God's words because God gives him the fullness of his spirit. The Father loves his Son and has put everything in his power. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not have life, 
but will remain under God's punishment, wrath. The word, the Greek word is orge, which is the usual word for wrath. And which and means also be a passion. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bible study guide says. Okay, that should be Gordon's. Okay. God does not punish. That's a problem with the Good News translation there. God, God well, lets things happen to you. Remember the phrase, God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. If God punishes, you don't have freedom. And okay, you can't have would love. You, would you feel more comfortable if it just said, remain under God's wrath? No. That's uh, what no, the Greek the, says. The, no, the, the, that's got too much baggage, too. Well, so in other words, we have to understand these words for what they really mean. We don't necessarily well, need to complain and, and, about the translation. Well, it's, that's, here, I, I have no argument with that. It, but we do have to spend some time clarifying these terms. Otherwise, we look, mm -hmm. sound like all the other religions. Mm -hmm. I think to have Bunch a of pagans. Picture, we need to have a grand view of the entire plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. Does it feed Yeah, in? but a lot of people have died before, before they get that one. <laughs> In fact, what okay. is this in uh, Hebrews 9, 22? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of, of sin. And now they say, no, it's no, no forgiveness. For, everybody being forgiven, you forgive a criminal, you forgive a, a, a sinner, he's, he hasn't learned his lesson. So he's going to go, likely to go out and do it again. And you have to be called recidivism. Okay, Gordon. John 3, 31 <clears throat> to 36, which, we, which Myra just read, continues the comparison between Jesus and John, showing the superiority of the Messiah over his forerunner. With John's testimony pointing toward Jesus, the idea of witness is again emphasized. Those who receive that testimony and believe in Jesus have eternal life. Those who do not receive him remain under the wrath of God. The Bible study guide's words. That's what the text says. God loves the world and sent his son to redeem the world. John 3, 16 and 17. But those who refuse the gift offered them will have to pay the penalty for their own sins, eternal death. So okay. is, does sin really have a penalty? It has a consequence. Or a natural result. Mm -hmm. Well, sin pays its wage, death. Is that a penalty? Wage, a penalty? It's a consequence. John continued to preach and teach and baptize. Do we have any evidence that John the Baptist ever performed any miracles? Okay, from the Bible study guide. John the Baptist did not immediately or completely disappear from the scene of history after he fulfilled his crucial and prophetic role as Messiah's, Messiah's forerunner. John was truly committed to Christ's mission. Nothing except imprisonment and martyrdom could stop him from his work. His example of radical commitment to the cause of Christ should inspire us to remain tenacious in his cause as well. Well, much later in his ministry, Jesus himself testified. Hona? John 5, 36 to 38. But I have a witness on my behalf, which is even greater than the witness that John gave. What I do, that is, the deeds, of my father, the deeds my Father gave me to do, these speak on my behalf and show that the Father has sent me, and the Father who sent me also testifies on my behalf. You have never heard his voice or seen his face, and you do not keep the message in your hearts, for you do not believe in the one he sent. Wow. That's pretty potent kind of language, isn't it? I mean, uh, I try to imagine, I, I've really struggled with this in the last week or so. How would you feel walking around with someone else that looks, looks just more or less just like you, dresses like you and everything, but he's God? Hmm. Yeah. And he, he walks up somewhere and he raises someone from the dead. Okay. <laughs> but most of them think that he is, really to this day, the uh, Talmud calls him a bastard. Yeah, because of his birth. There you are. So mm -hmm. there are some people who are fascinated by him mm -hmm. and others want him dead because he even dares to call him my father. Mm -hmm. That's blasphemy. 
There are three main occasions on which we know that God the Father spoke out about His Son, Jesus Christ. At His baptism, Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, at the Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, and then one time in the country courtyard. courtyard of the Temple of Jerusalem, John chapter 12, verse 28, um, Bible study guide, at the baptism of Jesus the Father and the Holy Spirit, joined the Son in making this marking. marking this important occasion, the commencement of Jesus' ministry, the Father states that Jesus is his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. But at the crucial time in Christ's ministry, the Father speaks yet again. And this time at the record, as recorded in Gospel of John. So here we have the actual words about the third occasion. John chapter 12. 12 this is, I'll go ahead and read this. 1220, Jesus said, Father, bring glory to your name. Notice that introduction. Then a voice spoke from heaven, I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. This was during the week before his final Passover, and it happened in the temple grounds <coughs> as, <we> I'm sorry, as a response to the request from some Greeks. Wow. So now... So this was in Jesus' last week. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Then is it that he gets glorified on the cross? That's what many people would say, and Je Jesus himself sort of implies yeah. that. Well, he so, was showing what he's like. He's showing his mm -hmm. true character. Did he? Right. Uh, what more stress he, could could you think of a person could experience, and and, and do it as graciously as right, he did? Right. Uh, Myra, you had a question. Well, I, I have the question. It says, "Then the voice spoke from heaven." This was in the was, temple courtyard. Yeah. The temple courtyard. Did nobody else hear that voice? Oh, well, other people heard it. Did they hear it as a voice or as? Well, noise? you can't tell that from sure for sure from the language. Yeah. In the from the Greek that I know. Yeah. Okay, here's a challenge for you. Do you agree with these statements from the Bible study guide? Okay, who's who's next? Jim. Jim. Me? My turn. Okay. As we have already seen, Jesus' hour of glory is the cross. Mm. Thus, the Father's testimony about Jesus points to the great sacrifice of the Lamb of God for the sins of the world. Now, I take exception to that. Jesus' death was not a sacrifice. Yeah. A, a Hold sacrifice on. is something you do to assuage the wrath of, of a, a, and get on the good side if, uh, of a schizophrenic deity. His death on our behalf paid the full penalty for our sins and in him by faith we'd never have to face that penalty ourselves that is that is okay. surely made up well there's part of it that clearly true clearly is true yeah but you we never have to face it and that you have is, uh, then is deception that's okay. how satan works in revelation 12 not uh, 12 9. okay so now did the death of jesus pay or paid the full penalty for all our sins if yes how did the death of Jesus pay the full penalty for all our sins? If the full penalty for all our sins has been paid, and that is all that is required for salvation, then shouldn't everyone be saved, even the devil? Does it say that anywhere, does it say that anywhere in the Bible? Mm -mm. And the that answer, whosoever believeth in him. Yeah, okay, that's a different story. <laughs> this is all muddied up with, with this stuff. While it is true that Jesus died to show us the ultimate result of sin, causing separation from God, the only source of life, resulting in death, Romans 6.23, and other places, there is no literal transferring of our sins somehow to Jesus. Each one of us will be judged based on what we have done in our lives on this earth. Why, why don't they make it simple and say, if you stop doing the bad stuff, uh, what is it, Ezekiel... 1827, uh, you'll, you'll save yourself alive. And then go to uh, uh, Matthew 20, excuse me, Matthew 19, verses 18 and 19. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery or, or dot, dot, adulterate. Uh, don't bear false witness. Um, love your fellow man and the God and uh, love your, honor your parents. 
and you'll have eternal life. That's what Jesus taught. That isn't all this other uh, stuff that's uh, edited out. Okay, well, let's go on. Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. The books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held. And all were judged according to what they had done. Okay. And this prior paragraph from the Bible study God it says he paid the full penalty. So how is that related to this? You're judged for based what you by what you've done. Okay, Gordon. Revelation twenty two twelve rather than what it says in yours. Uh, Listen, says Jesus. I am coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me, to give to each one according to what he has done. Good news Bible. Okay, and Ellen White. Spells it out in considerable detail. Okay. Um, this is from the uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 202. The long black catalog of our delinquencies is before the eye of the infinite. In other words, there's nothing wrong with his memory. <laughs> right. The register is complete. None of our offenses are forgotten. But he who listened to the cries of his servants of old will hear the prayer of the faith and pardon our transgressions. He has promised and he will fulfill the word from Ellen White. Okay. So my sins aren't at the bottom of the ocean, huh? No. Where's the commitment on the part of the sinner to not do those things anymore? Well, there's, I mean, you're going to face them. Pardon, pardon is, it doesn't solve a problem. You, you, uh, that person's life may or may not be turned around. That's, re uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, repentance. Okay, Lorna. Bible, from the Bible study guide, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 24. Knowledge, of, knowledge that Jesus is the Christ comes from God himself through the convicting power of his spirit. This theme appears frequently in John. So we're talking about themes, so this is one. Salvation does not come from worldly philosophy, science, or higher learning. It comes only from God to a heart surrendered in faith, and obedience to it comes only from God to a heart surrendered in faith and obedience to Jesus. Okay. John recorded numerous occasions in which Jesus commented about his own history and his own work. So we're trying to find out how much evidence there is for the divinity, etc. What did Jesus himself say? John chapter 7, verse 37, 38. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Whoever is thirsty should come to me, and whoever believes in me should drink. As the scripture says, streams of life-giving water will pour out from his side. Now, we're still wondering exactly what all that implies. Who else do we know about that, know about that testified about Jesus? Previously, we, have, previously we have talked about Nicodemus. What do we know about his relationship with Jesus Christ? The first episode is found in John 3. That's, most Christians know about that his meeting with the Messiah at night. We also have recently studied about the spices that Nicodemus took, Nicodemus took to the body of Jesus at, of course, at his death and burial, John 19, 39 and 40. On one recorded occasion in the meetings of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus spoke up on behalf of Jesus and said, does our law condemn someone without hearing him? John 7, 51. That's a provoking question. Yes. After crucifixion, and of course they responded, you know what they said, did you come from Galilee too? <laughs> that was their comment to him. After the crucifixion, Nicodemus openly supported the cause of Jesus verbally as well as with his wealth. Is that Gordon or Larry? It's a Jim. 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 Yeah, he just read. Jim, I'm sorry. You just read, so it's Jim. 
Now, when the Jews were trying to destroy the infant church, Nicodemus came forward to its defense. No longer cautious and questioning, he encouraged the faith of the disciples and used their, his wealth to help, excuse me, in helping to sustain the church at Jerusalem and in advancing the work of the gospel. Those who in later days, other days, those who in other days paid him reverence now scorned and persecuted him, and he became poor in this world's good, yet he faltered not in the defense of his faith. Amen. Go to Mike, Acts of the Apostles, page 105. Yeah, great story. So Nicodemus but, went from a wealthy man of Pharisee high, and member of high, the Sanhedrin. High standing to poor and uh, faithful follower of Jesus. Yeah. The other one was Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea. Yep. The beginning and end. But in fact, there were a number of Pharisees and even Sadducees who later became faithful followers, faithful believers, I'm sorry. For example, think of Saul, Paul, Simon, the former leper, and Joseph of Arimathea, which you just mentioned. Okay. Acts 6, 7. And so the word of God continued to spread the number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and the great number of priests, mostly Sadducees, accepted the faith. A great number of who? Uh, yeah. Sadducees. The higher echelon. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And in Acts 15, 5. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood who? up. The Pharisees <laughs> wow. stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So they haven't given up all their pharisaical ideas, but they were believers. They, they did decide which team they should be on. They just hadn't fully changed. I see. Earlier in this series of lessons, we discussed the feeding of the 5,000 as recorded in John 6. Now we need to come to the crucial final portions of that experience. That was a turning point in Jesus' ministry. The people wanted to make Jesus king. So John 6, 14 and 15, this is again after the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there said, surely this is the prophet <clears throat> who has to come into the world, who was to come into the world. Jesus knew that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force. So he went off again to the hills by himself and he sent the disciples away and went by himself, sent the people away. Yeah. So got to, got to nip this in the bud. Yep. From okay. the Bible study guide then. Uh, after the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, the multitude was suddenly aroused to crown Jesus king over all of Israel. But Jesus harbored no political aspirations, nor was he swayed as many politicians are, by popularity or the majority public opinion. Rather, Jesus ardently desired, desired to establish his kingdom in the hearts of the people. The people cried to coerce Jesus into fulfilling their political plans, but he withdrew to be by himself with his Father. The people wanted to accept Jesus on their own terms, ignoring the fact that they needed to accept him on his terms. In the end, they decided to reject him because they chose to focus on what was immediate and temporary. They did not look beyond those things to the bigger picture of the eternal and the unseen realities of God's kingdom. It is the inclination of the unconverted human heart to reject what does not fit its long-held preconceived notions. As okay. we can... Oh. Well, there, that's what we're talking about paradigms there. Okay. <laughs> As we can see, the people were so obsessed with the physical bread that they were blinded to the offer of Jesus' spiritual bread, which they desperately needed for salvation. Okay, well, the events of John 6 and 7 occurred just one year before the crucifixion and were a major turning point in the ministry of Jesus. He had left his quiet ministry in Judea when John the Baptist was imprisoned. Once the crowds were beginning to recognize how powerful he was and were getting ready to take him by force and make him king, he prepared to depart from the Jewish territory, go outside of Jewish territory completely. 
Then he began the preparation of his followers for what was to come, what was coming at the next Passover. Furthermore, John the Baptist was about to be beheaded. After the feeding of the 5,000, many wanted to follow him, hoping that he would continue to give them that marvelous free bread. When Jesus, even free fish, when Jesus tried to convince them that his mission was spiritual and that his life was spiritual bread, many of them turned away. Lorna? John 6, 51 to 71. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I give so that the world may live. This started an angry argument among them. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on the last day. For my flesh is the real food, my blood is the real drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood live in me, and I live in them. The living Father sent me, and because of him I live also. In the same way, whoever eats me will live because of me. This, then, is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the bread that your ancestors ate. They later died. But those who eat this bread will live forever. Jesus said this as he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of his followers heard this and said, This teaching is too hard. Who can listen to it? Without being told, Jesus knew that they were grumbling about this. So he said to them, does this make you want to give up? Suppose then that you should see the Son of Man go back up to the place where he was before. Let me interrupt for just a second. Those words without being told are important for our lesson here because this is another example of Jesus understood what's going on. He didn't have to, didn't have to wait for someone to tell him. He knew already what was going on. Grumbling. Mm -hmm. What gives life is God's Spirit. Human power is of no use at all. The words I have spoken to you bring God's life-giving spirit, yet some of you do not believe. Jesus knew from the very beginning who were the ones that would not believe and which one would betray him. And he added, This is the very reason I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father makes it possible for him to do so. Because of this, many of Jesus' followers turned back and would not go with him anymore. So he asked the 12 disciples, And you, would you also like to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And now we believe and know that you are the Holy One who has come from God. Jesus replied, I chose the 12 of you, didn't I? Yet one of you is a devil. As another indication, he already knows exactly what... And they probably didn't know what he was talking about. No. Mm -hmm. he but, was this, talk but this is written like 50 years later. Yeah, sure. He was talking about Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. For Judas, even though he was one of the 12 disciples, was going to betray him. Well, decision points came. Many realized that Jesus would not become the Messiah they wanted to drive out the Romans. Unfortunately, after the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus' statements about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, there developed a major division among the people. Some began to understand the truth and became followers of Jesus. Others rejected these words out of hand. However, when Jesus began talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, many turned away. To eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. Of this is from Ellen White. It's yeah. from Ellen White, yes. Is to receive him as a personal savior, believing that he forgives our sins and that we are complete in him. It is by belonging to, Be belonging, beholding. beholding his love, by dwelling upon him, upon it and drinking it in that we are to become partakers of his nature. What food is to the body 
Christ must be to the soul. Food cannot benefit us unless we eat it, unless it becomes a part of our being. So Christ is of no value to us if we do not know him as a personal savior. Uh, theoretical knowledge will do us no good. We must feel, feed upon him, receive him into our hearts, heart and that his life becomes ours, our life. His love, his grace must be assimilated. This is Ellen White Desire of okay. Pages, So we are supposed to practice his love and his grace. Hmm. I, I don't feel like what he said, this, this is what you could interpret that to mean. Yeah. He said his blood, his flesh. That's real clear. Those are not confusing and words at all. And he called it the truth. And he yes. called it the truth. Yep. And, and she is saying, oh, no, no, he meant... He meant to accept him into our hearts. Well, that's a whole different, it's very yeah, different. Yeah, well, but if you're talking about food, what do you do with food? You eat it. It assimilates, it becomes it, your body. It becomes part of you. So that's basically what she's trying to get to. Well, I understand her, it's yeah. simple. Yeah. But I don't understand him. How yeah. they could understand what, yeah. no. without yeah. the benefit of E. White. And yet Jesus, who said those things, was the best teacher <laughs> this world has ever seen. <laughs> with the insight and yeah. seeing our motives, our understanding, I'm sure what, there were, what would be written, etc. There yeah. must have been lot, all kinds of reasons why he said what he said, and we'll understand them someday, I think. That will be something we'll study in heaven. Yeah. This will be the message, Forever. though, that went out and converted the world. Yeah. So, Charles, I think you're next. This saying opened the eyes of the multitude to the fact that Jesus would not be their earthly king. He did not feed the mold aha, produced by the earthly thinking. They refused conver convention, conversion, conversion which would transform the way they thought so that they could recognize and accept Jesus as the Messiah. Many of his disciples left him at this point. From a human sense, they, this must have been hard for Jesus. The approbation of the crowd is pleasing. Who doesn't want to be liked? But seeing many people draw back and question one's principle is naturally discouraging as well. Seeing the multitude depart, Jesus asked his, asked his inner circle, the 12, if they would live too. This is adult uh, Sabbath school Bible. Yeah. Society. Why do you think it is that while looking at the same evidence, some rejected Jesus and others accepted him? Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit, if it was only the Holy Spirit, they would all accept him. They have different paradigms, different views. It's the question of how does this fit with what you already believe? The preconceived notions, yeah. Yeah. Notice these words from Ellen White about the attitude of the disciples toward Jesus. To whom, Ellen White again, to whom shall we go? The teachers of Israel were slaves to formalism. The Pharisees and Sadducees were in constant contention. And we know just a little bit about that, but yeah. To leave Jesus was to fall among the sticklers for, tie, for rites and ceremonies, and ambitious men who sought their own glory. The disciples had found more peace and joy since they, accepted, they had accepted Christ than in all their previous lives. I mean, I'm trying to think about that statement. I, I mean, I accept it because she said it, how much effect did the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees have on fishermen? Yeah. They probably didn't know a whole lot about it. <laughs> yeah. That's why they were the disciples instead yeah. of instead of Pharisees and Sadducees being his disciples. But and Pharisees and Sadducees were converted eventually. by Jesus' message. Yeah. Eventually. Yes. Right. So After I, the resurrection. Yeah, not until he left. Well, so a couple of them were, were before. Yeah. Nicodemus you, and yeah. Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah. And Simon, though. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, the disciples have found more peace and joy 
we, since they had accepted Christ and all their previous lives, how could they go back to those who had scorned and persecuted the friend of sinners? They had long been looking for the Messiah. Now he had come and they could not turn from his presence to those who were hunting his life and had persecuted uh, them for becoming his followers. To whom shall we go? Not from the teaching of Christ, his lessons of love and mercy to the darkness of unbelief, the wickedness of the world. While the Savior was forsaken by many who have witnessed his wonderful works, Peter expressed the faith of the disciples, thou art the Christ, or the Messiah. In Hebrew, it would be a Messiah. The very thought of losing this anchor of their souls filled them with fear and pain. To be destitute of a Savior was to be adrift on a dark and stormy sea. Wow. From Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages 393. At least the disciples had become convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. They determined that there was no place else to go. As Jesus revealed these new truths to the people in words which were strange to them, many of them turned away from him. Jim? What, we, excuse me, what can we learn from the story about the fact that the majority is usually wrong? Why must we remember this, especially with the aspects of our faith that are unpopular with the majority, even the majority of Christians, from the Bible study guide? Okay, this is not a discussion about politics. However, does this tell us that democracy is a flawed system because it's based on the will of the majority? There's nothing, who was it that said there's nothing Churchill. worse than a democracy other than every other system of yeah. government? Churchill said that well, also the democracy the is the worst kind of government there is except for all the others. Yeah, but also, was it Madison says, uh, um, you have a constitution is for re religious and, what is it, religious or righteous people anyway, people mm. that, oh, anyway, that, it's. Another way of saying that is something that my, one of my teachers said back when Academy, we were arguing about just funny things to talk about. We were standing in line for the lunch here. And finally, this guy was standing behind us. He just piped up and he said, we were discussing about how you could get into buildings that were, had locks and so forth like this. And he finally just piped up and he said, well, a lock is a hint to a gentleman. Uh, <laughs> Religious and moral people is what, yeah. what I was looking for. Okay. And, and can you think of what, what, what they're peddling in democracy now? I mean, they've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. I mean, the perversion of this, uh, teaching the young kids. And, and, yeah. uh, we believe that Jesus was the greatest teacher ever to exist in this earth. Why couldn't he explain things clearly enough so that his disciples would understand what was coming? So now basically we're saying, okay, the time has come for Jesus to try to explain to his disciples what's coming. The Bible study guide says, some said he was the, the prophet like Moses predicted long ago. See Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19. Others thought Jesus was the Christ, but this brought the argument that the Messiah would not come from Galilee. God forbid that God Messiah could yes. come from Golly. My goodness, that he would had to be of the Davidic line, and that he had to be born in Bethlehem. All of which were true about Jesus. Compare with Matthew one two, and two. Through though many did not seem to know this. Yeah. Do you agree with the following statements from the Bible study guide? Here's another challenge. And why didn't they know that? I mean, well, you don't know. Jesus didn't advertise. I, I was born in Bethlehem. Well, they knew that he was. I'm 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 of the tribe of. I'm of the Davidic line. Yeah. Well, they. Well, yeah, that I, I could see they wouldn't know, but knowing where he was born. It, that wasn't the message, as I would understand it. His. Message. What they knew of him was he's Jesus of Nazareth. Didn't bother to go any further. That was yeah. enough that they didn't need to know anymore. Yeah. And there's, isn't there some evidence that there's a, a, a ne excuse me, a Bethlehem up in near Galilee, or north? There of There probably Galilee? was. Yeah. Bethlehem just means house, house of, of bread. House of bread. Yeah. Go ahead. So here's some more controversial statements from the Bible study guide. What more important truth could there be than Jesus that Jesus Christ died for our sins? Yet, how did we ever come to know this crucial faith? By science, natural law, natural theology, logic, and reason? 
while these things could, in fact, lead us to believe in the Creator God, a first cause, an unmoved mover or something else, none of these disciplines, either alone or even together, could teach us the most important truth that we need to know. And here it comes from the Bible study guide, Christ died for our sins. Is that what it was? Jesus died because of sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not for our sins. We're not agreeing with this. We're saying Absolutely what it says not. right now. What should this, uh, continuing with the Bible study guide, what should this fact that all these disciples, even in principle, could not disciplines, lead? Disciplines, not disciples. D all these disciplines, even in Talking principle. Talking about evolution, et cetera, et cetera. Could not lead us to the one thing that we really need to know teach us how crucial it is to make the Bible our final and ultimate authority on matters of faith. Well, now there's that, a good point. There's a point. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure about the us. others. Jesus died for our sins or to pay for sins is pure paganism. I don't even like the word pure with it, but it is pagan. You are going to shake the faith of people all over the world. What's yeah. wrong with you? <laughs> well, they might listen and, and uh, maybe they it's should not my shaken. words. All I'm doing is attempting to quote uh, J Jesus' You're words. Right. Maybe they should You're be right. shaken. So what You're should right. we conclude from all this evidence? God apparently revealed a number of things to John the Baptist. Would you call these occasions the witness from God or from John the Baptist? Okay, from the Bible study guide. John the Baptist testified several times to the reality of the true Messiah sent from heaven. But surely the Father's testimony about His Son, along with the witness of God, the Holy Spirit, are the most powerful at Jesus' baptism. All three members of the Godhead were fully engaged. Okay, now let me yeah, interrupt for a second. Go ahead. Okay, if you were looking at a bunch of witnesses and you'd realize that one witness is God and the second witness is the Holy Spirit and the third witness is Jesus Himself, and then you're looking at apostles and prophets and John the Baptist and so forth, which one was, do you think would be the most important? Yeah. You want to summarize? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, we have just a few seconds. You want yeah. to summarize? Well, we, we basically have looked through this lesson trying to see more reasons why we should believe that Jesus was God, that He was the Messiah, and that He came here to accomplish, basically to teach us the truth about God. And he did all those things. He said it. He did. He did it very well. Um, and there are lots of different ideas about what he needed to do to accomplish that. Some people say he died to buy, paid to, to pay for our sins. Other people believe that he had much more than that to do. And in fact, he died for the benefit of the entire onlooking universe. Amen. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of getting to know you better through the work of your Son. We thank you so much for all that it should mean to us and all that it does mean to us. May we come to understand it better every day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>